begin by thanking the Kaisha Foundation and all of you for the possibility for being here and being able to share what I would like to share with you today. I took this challenge to try and look at current research and some aspects of where research may be headed in the world of environment that should be carefully considered in the RRI approach. I'd like to acknowledge some people that helped me with the content of this presentation because some of, some of this is very much um, very current. Um, these people are working on the World Atlas of Desertification, which is due out early next year. And also colleagues in Spain that um, are working with me on a Marie Curie project, Science for Society Solutions, which actually is very related to the RRI goals. I will have four key messages. I won't go through them right now. I will actually define each one as I go, and we'll jump straight into the first one. Stationarity is dead. Have you heard this before? So if you haven't heard it before, you need to, because it affects everything about environmental research going forward. So let's kind of consider this. The ideal is that research eventually will influence management practices and policy decisions. May not happen fast, but that's the ideal. And the vast majority of environmental research has been about looking at the past in order to predict what happens in the future. Can you sense any potential problem with that model today? The future is a little bit different than the past now. To demonstrate this, I'm going to use the example of runoff. So this is the water that, after a rainfall event, flows into streams. And obviously, if it's a lot of water, we can have flooding. And if there's none whatsoever, we're in drought conditions. This was, if you want to look at it that way, an assessment of past rainfall to predict in 2016 where we would be. The blue areas suggest that there would be that percentage more of runoff in those areas, and the browner, reddish areas, the opposite. There was going to be a percentage less runoff. And I think it's important for you to consider where those dry areas are, because I'm going to use that example a little bit later. So this is the static approach. This is the stationarity approach. But is it still valid? This is putting that into where we are today. So you're seeing the years run by from 2016 to 2084, all incorporating climate change and all other factors that might lead to change. And as you can see, the story is a lot more telling, but also those years are not being predicted solely on the past. So we have a totally different frame in which to look at the research questions. The second key message, also potentially introducing a new word, is that the world is not only global, globalization oriented, but it's also telecoupled. And this has to do with the, Maria gave some examples earlier today, the interactions in distant places that may have an influence in another place. But the problem is, from a RRI perspective, most environmental research is place-based. And when external locations and their influence are considered, they're exogenous variables. There's something that's on the outside. Feedback is not generally part of that research. And that's problematic because the world doesn't work that way anymore. It did in the past, but now, as I will show you a few examples, we have both globalization and teleconnections. We have human systems that are interacting socioeconomically. We have natural systems that are interacting environmentally, and we have crossover, so telecoupling. I'll begin the example by emphasizing that a lot of the world is arid, maybe 30, 35%, and a lot of people live in those areas, and a larger portion of those people are poor than in non-arid areas. So it's very, very sensitive to climate change and land degradation. And to give a sense of where this is going in the future, if you look at the graphs on the right and you point out the zero is down the middle, the top of there is the imminent future model, next 40 years or 30 years. The middle is near future, and the, the third one is far future. But what's most important here is 
Everything that's on the left of those zeros are cities that aren't arid today that will be in the future. And that represents 70% of the world's urban population, and the urban population is growing. That's a huge impact that is, needs to be considered in terms of telecoupling. And if we look at the source of water, increasingly is groundwater, and it's not always renewable, and it's very slow to renew, we get a sense, and this is only a five, six, five, six year, sorry, four year period, um, we get a sense of that depletion rate. I'm not gonna go into the example of Greenland, which has to do with climate change and the melt that's occurring under, underground, but we also have, if you look at the Middle East, some sensitive stories related to groundwater. Normally, I would show this graph as an animation, piece by piece. And I'm not gonna walk through it in great detail, but what I'd like you to focus on is that in each successive graph, what's on the y-axis becomes on the x-axis. In other words, population and the pressures on resources that result when mapped against resources, the second graph, give you a sense of the land degradation, the desertification, the resource sustainability issues, which then can be mapped against human well-being, which is our goal, increase human well-being, but of course, that degradation reduces human well-being. And then, if we map that against conflict, we see an increase. In other words, maybe not direct, but a lot of the conflicts that occur in the world today have some exacerbating elements that are associated with land degradation and climate change. But the question becomes, where should the study area be? Where should we be focused on? Almost every story you read about this is place-based, but is it really? What do, in this example, Eastern China, the Arab Spring, and climate change have to do with each other? What's the common element? It's actually in the slide. That's my hint. That's right, the loaf of bread, right? And where, where is that coming from? Well, from a climate change perspective, the availability of wheat and the prices going up in the year before the Arab Spring was hit hard by climate change in different ways in different wheat producing nations. But what put it over the edge was a very unusual drought in winter wheat in eastern China. The government, trying to protect its population, understandably, bought wheat futures. The prices went up even further. What countries in the world are almost entirely wheat importers? Japan, they could weather the storm. The Middle East, they could not easily weather the storm. And what I would let you know is if you look at photographs of the Arab Spring and you look at demonstrations, those baguettes are frequent. Why? Because the underlying pressures were there. Even though they may not have been the direct cause, they exacerbated the situation without doubt. There are lots of forms of telecouplings, but to continue this example, I'm gonna focus mostly on trade of goods side of this and land. But before I do that, I want to break another misconception that's common out there. It's, it's common because, in my opinion, we're using the wrong indicator. The OECD and many other developing nations try to look at how well they are managing their natural resources relative to consumption. And they use this index called domestic material consumption. There are other accounting methods. But this Second bullet introduces a new approach. It's called the material footprint. And as noted in the third bullet, it looks at non-domestic resources, which changes the story. A bunch of graphs again. The ones I would like you to look at are at the top and the far right. If you only consider the current statistics, the red lines, which is the domestic consumption index I mentioned, are below GDP and are trending downward relative to GDP. In other words, those economies are doing pretty well in not over-consuming the resource base. But if you add non-domestic resource consumption, 
which brings the green line, you realize that we're actually not doing better. We're doing even or potentially even worse. We're consuming somebody else's land. And now I'm going to show you that in some parts of the world, it's huge. In Japan, it's 92% of their consumption is based on land outside of Japan. Europe, a little less at 50%. The US, a third. So in this graph, the size of the pie chart is how much land that consumption inside a country consumes. If it's entirely green or mostly green like Australia, they're using land inside the country. But if it's like Japan, they're using land outside the country. So what does this look like in terms of telecoupling? It looks like that. And that means that when we say, hey, Brazil, if we take the forest example, you shouldn't be cutting down your rainforest. Or Russia, you should be protecting those trees but we're consuming them, we've got a telecoupling, and we also have a little bit of an ethical break here that is fundamental to what RRI should be considering. Same thing is true with cropland. It's the, the stories are different. The arrows are different, but it's still there. And the same thing is true for grazing land. We can do this with other resources. You probably heard about virtual water. If you go and buy some tomatoes that were grown in North Africa, you're not just buying the tomatoes. You're buying all the water that was used to grow those tomatoes. That's a transfer of both the tomato, the water, the land that it was growing on. Biofuels is a story you may have heard about. In the United States, in an effort to reduce emissions, which if you see up at the top left, it's done a big job of that in terms of reducing emissions. We have planted a lot of corn to create ethanol. But that resulted, if you move to the right through the United States, a displacement inside the country of land use. The crops that were switched out of whatever production into corn, those prices went up. Other parts of the world said, let's plant. We can make some money. A lot of that planting was conversion of new land. When you convert new land, you emit CO2 into the atmosphere, and as you see the number, in a larger amount than was intended by the policy. We have a disconnection there. This example is related to emissions. This is coal from Australia in 2004. The blue lines are the sending nation and sending to the receiving countries, which are in green. But I want to also emphasize the pink ones. It's called spillover in this model. Those that CO2 that gets emitted by the use of that coal influences everybody, not just the country that it was burned in. So we have the inequality key message here. And I'm going to go through five very quickly. The first one I've already mentioned, the impacts of climate change and land degradation are greater in developing nations and among the poor in developed nations. Next. As was pointed out earlier today, the number of scientists that actually participate in doing something about that that are coming from the regions of the world where those impacts are taking place are far lower than, let's say, Europe. Look at Africa at 8%. Next, we have a sensitivity issue here, that there's a lot more focus on what happens that ultimately affects Europe or the impacts of what that might be then the other way around, what's going on in those developing nations. And then internally in those countries, the self-valuation of the importance of the problem. Well, if poverty and violence dominate your day, all these other issues are a lower priority, so they get pursued less. It doesn't mean they're not of interest. They're just not reaching that level. And the bottom aspect here has to do with capacity. These are places where adaptation, mitigation, and restoration are harder. And then finally, I think RRI can make a big difference in this regard. And I'm going to give the example of land degradation neutrality, which you've, if you've heard of it, you're very modern because it's brand new. It's a new approach to looking at land degradation. In the past, all we did was fix it, meaning all the models were about 
preventing the degradation or restoring land. But we weren't keeping up. More land continued to be degraded. So somebody stopped and said, well, what if we actually anticipated new degradation at the same time that we make plans for preventing or restoring? If we do that and we try to keep it in balance, we might do a better job because we're using a holistic approach, a landscape approach, a prioritization approach. That is land degradation neutrality. And what's intriguing here is that the chief global body is, that's concerned about land, which is the U United Nations um, Convention on Combating Desertification, <coughs> UNCCD, they created a science policy interface, which I'm going to describe in a moment, that was then tasked with creating the conceptual framework for land degradation neutrality from a scientific perspective. And the SPI did that. There's a technical report and there's a policy brief that were very recently published. But what's intriguing is the SPI itself. It was created from a participatory type perspective. Ten independent scientists selected, five independently selected regionally, and five that are actually delegates from the science delegations to the convention which you would say, well, that's not very independent. But if you're trying to plug into policy and you have them in the same room, you might write the proposal in a way that would be more acceptable when it gets to the negotiating phase. The disconnect can be large without that. And it, in the actual conceptual framework itself, it was a participatory approach, not only with stakeholders, but also with scientists. There are principles, guiding principles, that are very based on RRI principles. So it's an example to say we can take on these environmental challenges in ways that fit the model that you all are pursuing here. Thank you very much.